David Kenyon Webster had wanted to go to England since he could remember. The idea of setting sail across the Atlantic on the high seas on a huge black boat before cycling through the British Isles, visiting the places which had been depicted in the books he loved. He preferred English poetry and had always played with kilted Scottish toy soldiers. His parents, who were of English and Scottish descent, dressed him like Christopher Robin as a small child. In September 1943, Webster finally got his wish, though he was no longer a little boy, and the toy soldiers were real men. He had come down from Camp Shanks and crossed the Hudson at midnight from West New York. As the ferry arrived at the river end of the Cunard Line Pier, a lone battalion straining under the weight of their barracks bags stepped off in near silence and moved toward a dozen or so Red Cross girls who were handing out coffee, donuts, and little green sewing kits. As they approached their floating home for the next 10 days, an officer passed out cards displaying their sleeping quarters and eating times. Once aboard, the men went aft to the sheets of canvas that had been stretched between iron pipes, which served as the men's bunks. They departed at sunup. There were no cheering crowds or confetti, just a handful of bored stevedores standing by to cast off the ship. The tugs pushed them clear before the tide assisted in moving the Samaria down the river toward her destination. David Webster was on his way to England, just not in the way he had always envisioned. For reasons unknown at this point, David Webster's memoirs, which were later published in his book, Parachute Infantry, did not contain any of his diary entries prior to late May 1944. He had started off in Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, and jumped into Normandy with Headquarters Company, but he had been at Taco and Benning and everywhere else. Easy Company had been the previous 12 months. Fortunately, Webster's wife Barbara had passed on all of his writings to Stephen Ambrose, who had assisted with the project, but left out his earlier entries. Dick Winters was able to retain copies of the correspondence and Webster's diary where they remained in his collection. The boat trip was not portrayed in the series other than a short sequence where Garnier and Liebgott have a slight disagreement, which didn't actually take place, as Liebgott was not even Jewish. The crossing was made in two ships. The experience of the group which traveled aboard the SS Samaria is summed up in a letter written by Webster to his young nephew following their departure from New York on September 6, 1943. If you ever sail on a troop ship, and I pray God you won't, I suggest that you buy yourself several cakes of salt water soap, a dozen sets of underwear, a solid aluminum mess kit, and several interesting books. You will then be in a position to enjoy the trip and to live in relative comfort. Because there were so many of us on the Samaria, our sooty, disheveled Cunard Line transport, there was not enough fresh water to go around. This is a standard phenomenon of army voyages. Indeed, fresh water could be used for drinking only at stipulated 15-minute intervals for a grand total of an hour and a half a day. If you think that was bad, consider the beards of my fellow passengers who were allowed fresh water for shaving only from 7.15 to 8 in the morning and from 6.45 to 7.30 at night. Thus, to remain even tolerably clean, we had to resort to salt water, which was always on tap in the showers. This required special salt water soap. It might not smell sweet or give us a schoolgirl complexion, but at least it lathered a little. I rubbed ordinary landlubber soap on my hands for five minutes at a time and produced nothing but wet slime. Salt water left us sticky, but we were clean. We kept telling ourselves, and that's what counted. We needed a dozen sets of underwear because we were sleeping with our clothes on and wanted to change as often as possible. My undershirt, to take a rank example, grew black and moldy in just three days' time. On account of the submarine menace, all ranks had to wear their life jackets, two little pillows fastened together with string, their cartridge belts with canteens attached, and had to sleep in their clothes. People who had been raised in pajamas found this both disturbing and uncomfortable. It was also rough and dirty on underwear. Incidentally, it would have been a smart idea, though discouraged by our officers, to have brought an extra pair of fatigues so that we could have varied our wardrobe a little. Our outer garments got dirty from sleeping in corridors and on the crummy deck. We found ourselves wiser and happier soldiers if we could beg, borrow, or steal a solid aluminum mess kit, for we were washing our utensils in salt water. 
Salt water, as we discovered to our sorrow, corrodes and rusts. After three days, my spoon was so rusty, I cut my lips when I ate with it. We ate twice a day, in the morning and a night in a dark, brown, crowded, unventilated mess hall on a lower deck where the soldiers fetched the food in tin buckets and cleaned the tables with dank black dish rags, the same tables we so blithely laid our bread on to spread our butter. Our diet, which consisted of typically British stewed tomatoes, baked fish, delicious hot ship's bread, and excellent tea. It was on the whole not exactly appetizing. The coffee was horrible. Etiquette was abandoned, and the grabbing at the table became so unbelievably ferocious that the Samaria took on the air of a floating madhouse. An aluminum mess kit, however, might have helped a little by preventing rust and saving our cups from the corrosion inherent in English coffee. The saltwater mess kit dip was set out in three pans. If you were on the end of the line, you felt you might as well wash your mess kit in a garbage pail because the water was so full of floating debris, bread, fish, cornflakes, etc. Above all, a man with a good mess kit had to be watchful, for we were living together so intimately that anything left loose would be stolen. I lost two blankets and a shelter half. A sleeping man was robbed of his life jacket and first aid packet. But on that voyage, an aluminum mess kit was the most coveted possession. As for the interesting books, they were a godsend to people like us with so much time on our hands. The only fire breaks in our daily forest of idleness were breakfast and supper, lifeboat drill at noon, and rifle inspection at one. The rest of the time we leaned on the rail and watched the convoy, which stretched as far as we could see. We walked the deck, shot craps, or played blackjack. Starting with five dollars, Haney and the second platoon worked up to twenty-two hundred, lost that trying to get twenty-eight more dollars, and came out with two hundred. If you didn't gamble, however, you read. We were so bored we looked over candy wrappers, newspaper scraps, antique magazines, anything printed. I even read a comic book. If we had been smart, or had been forewarned, we would have brought several interesting books along in our barracks bags. In some ways that trip was rough. But I enjoyed it, for it was a new, illuminating experience, a peek at the convoy system and the army at sea. We were so crowded we slept two men to a bunk, a day outside on deck, a day inside. On wet nights we hunted out a warm corridor or a spot down below, or we slept in the aisle next to our bunk. The decks were so overrun that there was little room for exercise. At night we had to stake out a sleeping place early if we wanted to lie in a sheltered spot away from the rain and fog. Still, for the most of us, this voyage was an interesting and novel undertaking, and we took it by and large with jovial spirit. People talk about morale, but all we asked of the army was good food, a warm bed, and fair treatment. The weather, thank God, was smooth all the way. Once the ocean was so unruly, I clung to the rail in utter misery and missed both meals, but that lasted only a day. The Atlantic failed to live up to its reputation that trip, and we arrived without incident or injury off Liverpool 10 days after leaving New York. Thanks for watching. There will be more videos covering David Webster in the future. A big welcome to all the new subscribers, and thank you to everyone who contributes to the channel.